Well, hi, I'm Dan Gwynn with FrancisSchaeferStudies.org and I'm here with Ellis Potter to do another installment of the Francis Schaefer Legacy Project. And what we're trying to do with these, uh, Ellis, is um, basically document a little bit of, of what Edith describes as the tapestry. Uh, and we uh, are looking at you and we're going, well, there's another thread. And uh, what's amazing is that each time we do these sort of interviews, we're finding out a little bit more about uh, Schaefer and that there's actually more and more people that were influenced by him. But uh, what we're trying to capture though is not just uh, something to elevate Schaefer as much as to find out what God did uh, through so many different people that had an exchange with him and with Edith and with Lepore and, and really the life work that they were dedicating themselves to. And so we wanted to kind of sit with you and get your story. Um, I was uh, looking over your bio and uh, I remember uh, reading a little bit about your early life and you talked about that you were a young man with many questions uh, perhaps uh, 13 I believe you started asking questions and started your exploration uh, to, to faith and so if you could maybe just tell us a little bit about that when I was a child I asked questions like children do about absolutes like how high is high how far is far, how small is small, these kinds of questions. And the Christians that I knew were not interested in these questions. They told me that I should have faith like a little child and not ask questions, which is a little bit absurd because that's what children do, they ask questions. Exactly. <laughs> and so, but I wasn't the only child who was told that in the 50s. It was a general approach to children's questions. Yeah. You believe what we say because we're your parents or this is the pastor, you believe what he says. And so people didn't learn to think, they didn't learn to deal with ideas. They learned to believe what they were told to believe. And then when many, when they left home, became independent and established their own ways of living, then they almost automatically left Christianity because there was no truth in it. It was just, this is my parents' world and this is what I was forced to say I believed and I always said I believed it, but <clears throat> they were very vulnerable to atheist professors in university and then many, many, many went off the rails because they weren't equipped to, to deal with ideas. And I never grew up. I still ask the embarrassing, shocking questions, annoying, impossible questions, the radical questions. And so I looked around to find if there was a religious group or a philosophical group that was interested in truth and wanted to think about absolute categories of reality and to, to go to the final parameters of reality, to think down to the bottom and out to the edges, to go as far as they could go. And I became involved with and researched many groups over some years. And I settled on the Zen Buddhist because they're always interested in absolutes. And they were the only religious group I ever had contact with that did not sell jewelry. Mm. <laughs> and that was very impressive to me. And in fact, I still admire that. Mm. Now, now, when you say that they uh, always had an interest in absolutes, can you describe what that means? Yes, they, they wanted to know the parameters of reality. They wanted to know what is the bottom line on things, not what happens existentially or what is pragmatic or what is instrumentally effective, but what is the, the envelope. Hmm. And then they would push the envelope of reality to, to find out what is our situation finally, what is our final situation hmm. in existence. Now, what's interesting to me is you say that, um, you know, I've interviewed quite a few people that have uh, come across Schaefer's books for that very reason, um, 
just because um, they realized that they could be a Christian without checking their mind at the door. Uh, and Schaefer kind of opened them up to begin proper study, to begin exploration. And it seems almost, um, well, as um, Jane Stewart Smith said uh, whenever she, she was talking with uh, Bruce, Dr. Bruce Little from Southeastern Baptist, he was t talking about it. He was told not to ask questions, and that was very disturbing to her. And she said, "It's it's it's just a travesty." And I think that's that's a very good, very strong word for it. Why aren't Christians really concerned with the absolutes? Why do you suppose that is, or why I suppose that was, especially of that generation? I'm not sure I know what the word travesty means. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's a negative word, I guess. Yeah. Travesty. Well, that's and in Jane Stewart Smith's language. I think it uh, probably means that it's just a horrible, horrible thing. It's bad. It's bad. Okay. Yeah. Well, I would agree with Jane. <laughs> it's not knowing the word. Yeah. I would agree that it's bad. Yeah. And why I think it is is that we had. <clears throat> We'd been through the, tw the first half of the 20th century, mm -hmm. and the beginning of the 20th century was there is no end to our might and expansion and creativity. Henry Ford was developing the assembly line, and the roads were being paved all over the country, mm -hmm. and new states were being added to the Union, and it was just the, the sky is the limit. And America was feeling its muscles. And then there was the Depression. And then it was survival. Just survive. But not only survive, there was a turning to religion in, in various ways. But it was instrumental religion. Religion that would make me feel better. It was, you have religion for a purpose, for a practical psychological, social purpose, rather than God for himself, because he is true. It was religion for belonging, religion for comfort, religion for these various instrumental um, functions of religion. And in that, because of the, the desperation of the Depression, it didn't invite question asking. It invited commitment, belonging, uh, being completely engaged in something, protecting the community, mm -hmm. establishing and putting up walls and parameters, and identifying in the midst of a, a rather chaotic economic situation and a chaotic um, geographical situation because many, many people had to move far away from where they grew up because of the Depression. Hmm. And then there was the Second World War and the patriotism and the, the culmination of Manifest Destiny that my country right or wrong and you mustn't question these things and you mustn't question, you must be loyal. Hmm. Loyal to the nation, loyal to God, loyal to the church whichever church it was. And, and there was a need for loyalty and commitment. And people were afraid of asking questions. Then also, in 1929, the liberals took over Princeton Seminary. And they took over the intellectual end of Christianity. And so the evangelicals, the fundamentalists who believed in the fundamentals of the Christian faith, became afraid of education and believed very strongly that if a person would think and ask questions, they would almost surely lose their faith. It was a very, very common attitude because the, the liberal intellectuals had taken over the major seminaries. And so there was a, a circling of the wagons and a closing in. And don't ask questions, dear. It's a really dangerous thing. You'll lose your faith. It's a slippery slope. You start thinking about things instead of just believing the old-time religion and the good old gospel 
and we really tremble for you. Hmm. An interesting climate. Mm -hmm. Well, and then so you were in the and sort of in the middle of that in some ways, uh, growing up and exploring different avenues of faith. Uh, can you talk just a little bit about um, how far you went with Buddhism uh, and that exploration? I became a monk and lived in a monastery and wore black robes and shaved my head and meditated 10 hours a day and had a guru. Where was this at? This was in California. In California? You can do anything in California. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of Zen in California. Mm. Zen has tended to concentrate on the coasts in New York and Massachusetts and in California and Oregon and a little bit in Washington and in Colorado and New Mexico. But California is big Zen territory. All right. And so now tell me, how did all of that, I mean, how did you eventually run into Francis Schaeffer and, and uh, how did that, you know, uh, impact you, especially in your current way of thinking? I was traveling in Europe, visiting monasteries, thinking that I might be on my way to Japan, which is the source of Zen. Japan and Korea are the traditional Zen cultures. And I met an old friend who was a Christian, I'm a musician, and we had done musical things together <clears throat> and become friends. And we traveled together. He went with me to places I wanted to go, monasteries and centers, and it was interesting for him. And then he said he wanted to go to Mabri because he'd heard about it. Yeah. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, it's a community of Christians, and they think. And I said, no. <laughs> so he said, well, that's what I heard, and I want to check it out. So we went together, and it was a very interesting trip to get there. And we were there, I think, three weeks, and I didn't like it really? because people were talking all the time. There was no silence, and it was just very different from the monastery. And I thought, what kind of spiritual search is this with all this noise going on? <laughs> so I went to Italy for four months and studied the Japanese tea ceremony in Rome and visited various monasteries here and there. And then I got tired of speaking Italian and my friend was still at La Brie and I wanted to see him. And also I thought that the ideas that I'd heard at La Brie were so dangerously wrong that someone should go and help these people. So I went as a missionary of Zen Buddhism to Francis Schaeffer and the La Brie community. And it turns out I'm not a good missionary because I got converted by the people that I went to, to help. So you now describe the conversation with you, I mean, uh, with uh, Francis Schaeffer. You, you said um, in your bio that it really was, uh, your conversion was a direct result of some specific conversations with him that, uh, that really kind of stirred you up. The key thing that Schaefer said was, I don't know. Wow. <laughs> that was really very important in my coming to know the Lord. Schaefer was very generous with me, especially in public discussions. He would deal with a question of mine for 30 minutes. And then he would say, we have to stop. Um, is that helpful? And sometimes I would say, no, it's not. And he would say, next week, we'll start here again. And then we would come in the next week, and he would say, yes, we were talking with Ellis about this question. And he would continue. He had a really good memory wow. in, in, that, in that way. And <clears throat> I would ask him, is the non-personal necessarily sub-personal? Couldn't there be a super-personal, non-personal from which personality proceeds? <laughs> these, these kinds of questions. Does God uh, choose the aspects of his character or does he discover himself to be that way? 
and Schaefer worked with these questions. And then one day, I was sitting way in the corner in the chapel, and I raised my hand, I don't know how he saw me, and he said, yes, Ellis. I said, Dr. Schaefer, why is God? And people started to laugh, and he was really angry. He said, don't laugh. And he said, I do not know. Next question. Well, I was working with epistemology, and my question was, can a human being have a relationship of knowledge with something outside of that human being, which is undeniably valid? And Schaefer knew that he did not know. And I couldn't touch it. And I thought, if he can know that, he could possibly know something else. And so could I. And that opened the door. So Schaefer was, in a sense, the answer man. He answered all these questions and he wrote all these books and everything. But the Lord works in mysterious ways. And the most important thing Schaefer said to me was, I do not know. So here's, here's Schaefer, um, the expert, yet he's a finite man, and there's just some things he doesn't know. No. And I think that you empathize with that, right? No, I didn't empathize with that. I empathized that he knew that he did not know, that he, he had epistemological that. certainty That's good about something, no matter what it was. The fact that it was that he did not know was almost immaterial. Mm. But it was um, undeniable, untouchable. His knowledge was like the rock of Gibraltar, hmm. solid. He knew that he did not know. You know, I noticed that you know there seemed to be kind of a uh, bit of providence that was transpiring in the sense that you know here's a, your your whole life at that point had been devoted to questions, and you line uh, you know end up at Labrie, the place that everybody operated under, the place you can go to get your questions answered. But then now you tell me that the answer that that answered the question for you is, I don't know. Yeah. I think God has a sense of humor. <laughs> I agree. I agree. So that's, that's rather wonderful to hear that. Um, so now, you were at Labrie in, like, I believe it was, I read 1976. So that would have been about the time that uh, How Shall We Then Live was being put out. Uh, do, do you recall any memories about Labrie at that, that time that uh, were distinctive? Yes, well, I'm in the films, in two episodes. You may not recognize me now, but... Um, so I was part of the filmmaking. Okay. And the distinctives of the Swiss branch of La Brie at that time, as compared to other religious communities, or compared to now, or... Or just maybe uh, what it was like at that time, you know? Uh, what leaders were there maybe uh, that, that uh, influenced you or that impacted you, as well as um, you know, what was the community like at that time? Well, the people I lived with for, for a year, the first three months before I was a Christian and then after I was a Christian, were Udo and Debbie Middleman, mm -hmm. Debbie Schaefer's third daughter, and they were very influential in my life, I would say they and the Schaefers. Larry and Nancy Snyder were extremely kind to me, and that was an influence on my life. And it was a very large community compared with the library branches today, but there weren't very many branches at that time. And Switzerland was not so expensive as it is now. And Switzerland was on the migration hippie route from <laughs> Europe and North America to India. And so people naturally drifted through. Interesting. And, yes. And there were over a hundred students and people in uh, bed and breakfast and barns in the surrounding <laughs> area coming to the lectures and participating as they could and we had what we called guest tapes twice a day mm -hmm. and when I was a young worker I led the guest tapes once a week and they were uh, the gathering of the visitors for whom there was no room 
to be a student in La Brie who would listen with a staff member, with a worker, to a recorded lecture or sermon and discuss it for a couple of hours. This happened morning and afternoon and the workers took turns doing the guest tape so that there would be something some kind of personal context, some kind of teaching, sometimes some, some type of discussion gathering for anyone who wanted it, even though there wasn't room for them to eat the meals and sleep in the chalets and, and to be a full-time residential student. So there were times when people were not necessarily able to stay at Labrie, but they were still students kind of living in the area? Well, in the early years, that was constant. Really? Wow. There were just always people on the outside who couldn't get in because there was no room. Mm. Who had come to the village because of La Brie, <clears throat> who wanted to be involved in La Brie, and we did what we could to involve them. And the guest tapes was something, the, the Saturday night discussion was public, and the place was packed and people standing on the balcony. and. Um, loudspeakers in the basement and um, it was a very very busy intense situation. Mm -hmm. Now do you feel that um, were, were people kind of uh, coming in from all nationalities and and from all kinds of different uh, hang-ups or questions and things? Yes but of course most of the people were native English speakers. Right. So we had North Americans and English and Australian and a few South Africans. But then there were Koreans and uh, Scandinavians, many who came. But it was an English-speaking community. And so most people who came were from the English-speaking world. There were uh, if there was an African, which there was often one or maybe two Africans, mm -hmm. it was special. It, it, it wasn't common that there would be half a dozen Africans in the community or half a dozen Middle Eastern people in the community. It was in the communist era. And if there was a Polish person who came, that was very, very special because they had to have a special passport and escape in a sense mm. under guarantees to, to go back and it was very precious to us if someone came from a communist country. Mm. So now you mentioned there was sort of like a, a hippie route if you will but there's also I, I know like um, different places that were sort of uh, that feeding Libri if you will with people that uh, that Edith describes like the uh, like Lausanne, uh, like music schools, and then maybe like the, the there was a couple like uh, uh, young people's schools, I guess a girls' school, um, and uh, so she also talks about uh, some particular military base for young young men who were stationed overseas. Do you remember recalling any of that? Oh yes, people came from all of these various places, but they weren't a major portion of the student population. But Edith is quite right to point out that all of these different places and institutions, um, from them came one or two students to La Brie. But the major portion of students who came to La Brie were from unexpected places far away. And in those days, in the late 70s and early 80s, Many people came to La Brie who had never heard of it. We prayed constantly that the Lord would bring the people of his choice. And people would come in, knock on the door and say, what is this place? And we would think, the Lord must have sent you because you're here and you don't even know what it is, but probably you need to be here and so have a cup of tea. Yeah. Now there's been some discussion on this that you know, in some ways, there's there's a very romantic ideal that some people uh, look at when they look at Labrie. At the same time, I've heard several workers say, uh, like, well, for example, like Jerem Bars in his lectures, he talks about how that 
uh, there's sometimes when he would get up and it's just, I don't want to see another face. And uh, there was a difficulty there sometimes just because, you know, people would be coming in and have new hang-ups, new things. And so what's the, uh, I guess, the reality of that? You're seeing people, new people day by day and uh, new questions day by day. It, it is taxing, isn't it? Well, new questions would actually have been refreshing. It was the same questions over and over really? again, <laughs> generally. But the library work was intense, slogging, hard work mm. on a variety of levels. Intellectual, practical, social, psychological. Mm. It was total life because you lived together and you shared your bathroom with six students that you'd never met before. It was your house and you maintained that house and were responsible for the hospitality and some of the teaching and everything. And it was full of strangers all the time that you welcomed and got to know and tried to bless, who got along or didn't get along. And it was intense hard work. It was glorious. But the possibility of burnout was there all the time and happened. So it was it was very, very hard and I would love to go back and repeat it. Really? Well, one of the things, I think that you pointed something else out too, is that it's, it was sort of a holistic thing that was going on, where you're, you're not just um, up there on this uh, mountain as the ivory tower, if you will, entertaining questions, but um, you're doing gardening and cooking meals and serving people at the same time you're doing all this other discipleship or, mm -hmm. or just inter introduction to the faith and challenging uh, or, or fielding these questions, right? Well, the cash flow was generally thin. Mm. And so we needed to be very creative with the cooking and the decorating and the heating and uh, hot water and organized minimalistic uh, use of various things. And we kept chickens to eat the eggs and had gardens, and the gardens were a major part of our food budget. Mm. And that all involved work and maintaining. We maintained our own properties, and, the, and we needed the students to help. Mm. So when the students came to La Brie, they studied half a day, and they worked half a day, and they paid a minimal uh, student fee which I think was about 20% of the cost of running La Brie. The students paid 20% of what it cost and God paid the rest because there was no visible means of support. The money just came as it came under the Lord's grace and we didn't know where it was coming next. And at the end, for instance, of May, when we paid all the bills, it was a miracle, and we rejoiced, but no one had any idea how the, pay, the bills would be paid in June. There needed to be another miracle. So there was a certain stress and tension. We don't know if we'll be here next month, because we might not be able to, to pay the bills, mm -hmm. but every month there was a miracle, which was rather encouraging, yeah. which all adds up to a sort of an intense lifestyle. Well, and that's something I've heard quite often too, is that, um, you know, Labrie, you know, with, with the success of like, how should we then live, for example, while you were there, uh, you know, and the, those films and those books, uh, they provided some funding, I'm sure, but uh, Labrie was still um, sometimes month to month still. Really. Yes, because Labrie did not publish books. There's no Labrie publishing house, and Labrie did not make those films. Mm. It was made by a company who needed to profit from the film in order to stay in business. And so there wasn't a tremendous amount of money. And yeah, the, the, the money, the funding for La Brie was consistently miraculous. Right. Wow. And that was a testimony to those people that were there. It was. Yeah. It was. Mm -hmm. Now, can you talk just a little bit about, um, you know, that 
after your conversion, dealing with all of the kind of concepts of, uh, like for example, Buddhism, you know, you, I think you've said in a little bit in your bio that it leaves you kind of with nothingness. There's uh, a point at which you're really trying to uh, find out what is real, I think, with uh, in your conversion experience. Is that correct? Yes, I was looking for truth and reality most of my life. Hmm. Very good. So do, could you contrast that a little bit with uh, how that uh, was a paradigm shift for you uh, coming from uh, Buddhism? The Buddhist absolute was not a lot of Buddhists are directly aware of is, especially in Zen Buddhism, a pregnant nothing. There is a worldview of unity. The original perfection of reality is a perfect and complete unity. And we suffer because we have come into an illusion of diversity. Okay. So the solution to that suffering is awakening from the nightmare of diversity into the true reality of a perfect total unity, awakening or enlightenment. Mm -hmm. In the biblical worldview, the original perfection is perfectly unified and perfectly diversified. So that diversity is not the cause of suffering. We suffer in unity and diversity, but the cause is something else. Mm. And so that is quite different. It's, it's a simple but radical difference. And it's a radically different goal. So in, in Buddhism, suffering is caused by desire. And any kind of relationship involves various kinds of desire. So salvation involves the, the resolution of relationships in a total and perfect unity. In the biblical worldview, relationships and diversity are not the cause of suffering, and salvation involves a restoration of other-centered relationships, hmm. which is a paradigm shift. Yeah. Those two worldviews that you just uh, discussed or just brought out, um, for you personally transitioning from the one to the other, um, did that happen immediately? Did suddenly just everything became clear? Or was it something that happened over time? Both. Both and situation. Interesting. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I've, I've found very interesting um, in reading was finding out that, you know, you have some of the same emphasis that I hear Schaefer say uh, quite a bit, like uh, emphasis on the, the person and the non-mechanical, um, on uh, really dealing with people as individuals when you're in evangelism situations, for example, um, recognizing doubt as something that's a valuable part of the Christian faith. Can you talk about those things? Maybe starting with uh, the person in the non-mechanical. Well, it's a worldview question. Is the reality in which we live fundamentally mechanical or energetic or personal? Mm. And of course, an atheist would need to believe that it is mechanical and energetic. That the bottom line is energy or mechanism and the biblical worldview indicates that the bottom line is personal and personal means relational right the bible indicates that god is three persons and that he has relationships among himself so on the absolute level of reality before there is anything else there are personal relationships, which, if that is true, 
it means that it is essential for human beings made in the image of God to develop personal relationships rather than mechanical, instrumental functioning and success. What would you say to a Christian who's dealing with doubt? I would say don't run away from it. Face it. Work through it. Talk about it. Bring it to other people. Bring your doubts to God. Don't suppress them. Don't hide them. Don't deny them. And I think you go a little further even, right? And that doubt is actually a useful tool uh, for the Christian, right? Yes, for anyone. If you don't doubt that you know everything, you can never learn anything. Wow, yeah. If you don't doubt that your knowledge is perfect, you can never improve your knowledge. So some people who are Christians who maybe are afraid of doubt may be stopping themselves from actually growing. Yes, it's because, possible. Because they've, they've already learned everything in their mind. Yes. And maybe they've not taken it upon themselves to, to go beyond those boundaries. And the attitude can be, my mind is made up, do not confuse me with the facts. <laughs> Yeah, I think we've heard that one before. Um, if you could just talk a little bit about um, the ideas of a childlike faith. You mentioned that a little bit earlier, um, where Christians had actually told you to have a childlike faith, but they weren't really talking about real children, because real children ask questions. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes, Jesus said, you must become like a little child in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. Trust, courage, curiosity, learning, growing, asking, discovering, liveliness. Yeah. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And if you grow up, you're out. <laughs> Interesting. No. It, you have to remain as a little child. So, little children are bold. They put everything in their mouth. They just they have no fears. And they ask questions because they trust that the world and mommy and daddy will answer. And then, they are betrayed. Mommy and daddy don't know. The world frustrates them. They are lied to. They, they run into failures and uh, contradictory answers to things. And they get very frustrated. So they close down. And this process of dying, of closing down and building walls and avoiding the pain of asking questions by stopping asking questions, we call maturity and sophistication. But the real word is death. And so when we become sufficiently dead, then we're adults. And then we teach our children to die, rather than to remain alive and asking questions and discovering things. And Jesus is saying, you must become as a little child, which is frankly terrifying. Because little children live very intense lives. How many times a day does a little child laugh? And how many times a day does a little child cry? It's an intense existence. And we're not ready to remain. I mean, you meet older people who are childlike and absolutely lovely and fresh and learning and asking and curious. And it's a very, very beautiful thing. And this is what Jesus wants for us and says, this is it. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Become like a little child. Mm -hmm. yeah, those are wonderful insights. Wonderful insights. Well, I just want to give you um, an opportunity in closing to uh, maybe talk to us a little bit about um, your book and um, what you're doing in that area of things. Uh, maybe also you can mention a little bit or explain a little bit about your ministry and, mm -hmm. uh, and just uh, kind of share what you do. I am a pastor in Switzerland and I work 20% for the church that I pastor and the rest of the time I travel quite a bit and 
I've given over decades lectures about comparing worldviews. And people have asked, is this in book form? And oh, you should write a book. And then I never did because I'm very lazy and I'm not a writer, <laughs> I'm a talker. And then someone offered to edit my material into a book. And I worked with them. And a book came into being. And it's called Three Theories of Everything. And it's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. It's an e-book, Kindle book and a paperback book and it's going to be an audio book soon and it's being translated into several languages. And I just got an email last week from the man who edited the first book saying that he would like to do the next two books with me, two, two more projects. And the next book will be about epistemology how do we know? And I'm starting to get quite excited about that because people are very confused about how we know. How we know yeah. And then the third book will be about spirituality. What does spiritual mean? What does spiritual growth look like? Hmm. And my work is with the church in Switzerland. But traveling, I lecture for churches and um, conferences and conventions and for um, university works like InterVarsity, Campus Crusade, Operation Mobilization, Youth with a Mission. I've, I've been involved with all of those works. I am no longer a full-time library worker, but I am a friend of library and I visit library branches to lecture for a week or two weeks at a time. I go sometimes to Swiss library. I go actually more often to English library. Mm -hmm. I will go in June to Canadian library. I've been in Australian library and yeah. there I probably will go next year to some library activity in South Africa. I've been to Korean library a couple of times. So I like to get around and visit people. I love to visit. Yeah. And I try to help and fit in and maybe add something to the teaching and deal with the students. And um, I travel a lot in Eastern Europe. So I've been in Poland and Czech Republic and Slovakia and Hungary and Slovenia and Latvia and Ukraine and Russia and mm -hmm. Romania and Bulgaria and around yeah. and I will go soon to Ukraine to do some teaching in Kiev and I will go to Slovenia uh, again in, in June hmm. and the book has been helpful. The book is published in Russian as well as English and it's very useful to have this book because people can read it and underline it and give it to somebody else and um, it's it's already being useful. Excellent. Well, something for them to refer to. As well. Yes, it's something to refer to and the book is in one sense it's a Christian book, in another sense it's not a Christian book, it's a human book and it's accessible I believe and hope to anyone. And there have been two young teenagers who have written reviews of this book and had a good understanding of it. So it's fairly accessible. Huh. And non-Christians can read this book. It's not full of jargon. My hope is that it's a book that Christians can give to non-Christian colleagues and neighbors and relatives without embarrassment. Huh. It's not super spiritual or cheesy or it doesn't make great assumptions on what people think or whether they believe in the Bible or not. It's a discussion of reality from a human point of view. But it contains the gospel. Interesting. Well, I'm excited. I, I want to actually get it and read it myself. I've been hearing about it. so uh, yeah. Well, if it's not very good, it's not very long. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's been wonderful talking with you. Um, Thank you. I think that uh, you know these things that we're hearing from the scholars uh, or people that have uh, spent time, like many many years at Labrie and, and working and doing that, 
um, we just find that what we discover is all these wonderful things come out. It's just something beautiful that uh, really, I think, uh, it speaks to me personally. And if anything, I'm doing this because it edifies me spiritually. Yet at the same time, I think that other people will realize that uh, this is really something. This I can I can do something myself mm -hmm. um, to begin to show hospitality towards people, to begin to um, embark on some. Uh, uh, the, the study and, and that I, I can uh, strengthen the whole man rather than just have a heartfelt spirituality. I can have a mindfelt spirituality as well. Uh, so we love talking with you. And so it was a, Thank it was, you. It was wonderful. It's been good to talk to you. Uh, it's good to meet you. Thanks. God bless you.